Happy Easter. We're going to do this a few times, but just to get practicing, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Well done. Welcome, welcome. Come on in. Welcome. Now you guys are here. We can get started. Happy Passover to all the things. So um, I'm Heather Arkovich. I am pastor here at North Madison Congregational Church, uh, where we believe that all members are ministers. We believe in the ministry of all the baptized and where we say that whoever you are and wherever you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. We're glad you're here and we hope that you feel safe and welcome here. And if there's anything we can do to help with that, please let us know. Um, you may know our COVID task team has decided that uh, masks are encouraged, but optional. The center aisle is you sit wherever you want. Um, it's a free for all and on the sides, we're still social distancing. And uh, if you're with us at home, we think we have the sound system fixed. So it's extra prayers, but welcome to our virtual Facebook and Zoom folks. It's so good to be here with you. And we have probably about as many people online as we have in the room. So that's pretty exciting that Zoom allows us to do that right now. So what else do I want to tell you? Let's see. Um, just so we have it in the record, if anybody looks at us online, we use all of our music by license, one license number 738900-A. <laughs> in your pews, there are envelopes. If you would like to make an Easter donation to Ukraine, just write Ukraine on the envelope. If you would like to support our Deacons Fund, which is the fund that we use to help support um, our members and friends who are in rough times and need a little extra something, you can just write Deacons Fund. And if you'd like to make another offering, just throw it in the plate, free form, and we will know what to do with it. So that's all there for you. And I think that's all I needed to say, except to introduce our other leaders, and then I'll let Melissa, our deacon, take over. So on high, we have Linda Giuliani, our amazing minister of music. Woohoo! <laughs> In the back, we have Tom, who is sometimes supported by Barb, who is running our virtual stuff. We have, woohoo! Uh, we have ushers in the back. It looks like today, I can't see everybody. So ushers, yay for the ushers. <laughs> and over here, we have an amazing string ensemble. And we have Sue Timoney Hall, who is our minister of faith formation. Behind me, we have Melissa, our deacon this morning, and Matt, our junior deacon, who will be leading us in worship. And of course, we have Bill, our choir director, and all of you. So thank you all, and a special thanks to everyone who has put together this Lent and Good uh, Holy Week and Easter, our worship scapers, our vigilers who kept vigil since the Friday night service, um, everyone. Thank you. We here at NMCC uh, don't do anything alone. We always do it in community, and what a wonderful community to be part of. So happy Easter, and here is Melissa. Yes, happy Easter on behalf of the deacons. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right, wonderful. So um, it really is so wonderful to be here with you this glorious Easter morning. And uh, speaking of hearing, um, uh, if you do need an assistive hearing device, we have wonderful uh, hearing assistant devices in the back. Um, just raise your hand and an usher will get those to you. And Worshippers in the sanctuary today may share your prayer requests, your joys and concerns, by uh, using the paper in your pocket, your pew pockets, there'll be uh, pink for joy and green for concerns, and these will be collected by the ushers during our offering, so they'll just put it right in the offering plate, and that will be during the second hymn. Um, or uh, you may also send your joys or concerns to our prayer phone um, with joy written in capital letters or concerns um, in capital letters so you can pick it up. And the, uh, the phone number for that prayer phone is 475-261-2230. So now we'll transition into our worship service. And uh, again, we are so glad to have all of you with us this beautiful Easter morning, both here and virtually as well. Your presence here enriches our time together truly. 
And I hope what's up today will be meaningful, healing, and inspiring for you. And also connect you more deeply with one another and with our Creator. Amen. I invite our choir forward. This joyful is the And now, will you please join us in our call to worship by saying, Alleluia, Christ is risen, each time you hear us say, they sang. So when you hear those words, they sang, you know what to do. 20 hours and 30 minutes ago, the sun rose over the sheep grazing slopes of New Zealand. Christians there and all across the islands in the Western Pacific were the first to greet this Easter day. While we were still living our lives yesterday, they sang, Hallelujah! Christ is risen! An hour later, Eastern Australians greeted the day with song as the rising sun sparkled on white sand beaches. While we were still living our yesterday, they sang, Alleluia! Christ is risen! Their Alleluias were joined by songs of praise from Japan, Korea, and Southeast Asia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and India. While we were still living our yesterday, they sang, Alleluia! Christ is risen! And into the Holy Land itself, Pilgrims who walked the very way of the cross that Jesus walked 2,000 years before sang out their joy. As our Saturday turned into Sunday, while it was still dark for us, they sang, Hallelujah! Christ is risen! Into Madagascar, South Africa, and Eastern Europe, the wave of Alleluia continued. Even in war ravaged Ukraine, while we are we were yet sleeping, they sang. Hallelujah. Christ, 
Christ is risen. As the sun rose over Western Europe, in Naples and Rome, in the villages of the Rhine and chalets of the Alps, in the great cathedrals of France, while we were yet sleeping, they sang, Hallelujah. Christ is risen. In London and Madrid, in Lisbon, Cardiff, Dublin, and Glasgow, in West Africa, while we were yet sleeping, they sang, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Christ, Christ is risen. Across the Atlantic to Iceland and Greenland, and in Brazil, the sound of praise echoes onward. While we were yet sleeping, they sang, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. The eastern sun journeyed on through the Maritimes, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. As we were stirring from our sleep, we could almost hear them as they sang, Hallelujah, Christ is risen. And now the glorious Easter sun has awakened us to the joy and hope of resurrection. Some of us gathered among the saints just up the road in Summerhill Cemetery as the sun came over the horizon in North Madison this morning. And all of us are here, joined my plate, and all of us here now join the wave of Alleluia's and sing Alleluia. Christ is risen. I invite the choir.
seems strange to do this here after that uprising of sound, but this is the point in our worship service where we get still for a moment. <laughs> and so I invite you to settle your bodies in and get comfortable. Um, feel the weight of your feet on the floor, your butt on the bench or at home, whatever you're sitting on. And if you're comfortable, close your eyes. If you're not, just soften your gaze. And people, children of God, let us just take in a deep breath of this Easter Sabbath. Breathe in God's resurrection light and hold it within you. Let it stretch to every last cell of your breathing, being and then exhale. God's peace. Breathe in God's light slowly. Let it fill you and breathe out God's peace. For many of us, this may be the first intentional breath we have taken all week or maybe all year. So take it in. Breathe in God's light. It is here. Breathe out God's peace. And this Easter morning, I invite you in your imagination as you continue to breathe in God's light and out God's peace at your own comfortable pace, but slowly and thoughtfully, I invite you in your imagination as you breathe in the light, imagine the light of that Easter morning, the first one. Imagine the sun let rise just peeking over Jerusalem. Imagine the light as it climbs in the sky. Can you hear the birds singing? Can you feel the breeze? Can you sense the dew, the early morning dew, sparkling as the sun rises, first beams hit it? As you imagine being in that place on that day, imagine Jesus first awakening too. Imagine him in the cool and dark, the dampness of the empty tomb. Imagine him as he opens his eyes, realizes he is still alive or alive again. Imagine what his body feels like, the weight of it on that stone slab the cloth wrappings his friends have put around him. Imagine him stretching his toes, his arms, his body out and feeling the life course back into them. Imagine him sitting up, putting his feet on the ground, shifting his weight, rubbing his neck, feeling the wounds again, in his hands and remembering all that has come before. Imagine him remembering, looking down from the cross at the people who jeered him and the few who loved him and stayed by his side. Imagine him remembering taking what he thought was his last breath after he said, it is finished. Imagine him realizing that it was not finished at all, that he was awake and alive. And then suddenly he notices light is growing as the stone that is covering the tomb begins creakily to be pushed away. And the light of the day streams in and Jesus realizes he is alive. He is wrapped in love. And his heart, once betrayed, swells with relief and with love again. Let us be with him in that moment of gentle rejoicing and realization. Let us let that sunlight of that Easter morning into the tombs of our hearts. Let us realize that nothing is ever finished. Love will always win. And if love hasn't won yet, then my friends, the story is not over. Let's continue 
now in worship. As Sue Timoney Hall tells a story to our kiddos. Here's Sue. Heather. Happy Easter, everyone. <laughs> Do any of our kids want to come up and get a little closer so you can see the pictures? Anyone? Anyone? You'll join me? Heather's very brave. Anyone else brave? Oscar, are you brave? You can bring Grandma or Grandpa up if you'd like. <laughs> Yay, thank you for coming up. Come on, Danny. You, woohoo! She's a sport. <laughs> I tell you, it's so great to see you all today. Yeah, does everyone want to look at Danny's shoes? They are awesome. You have become a trendy teenager. I love it. <laughs> so, hi, Oscar. Do you want to turn around so you can see the pictures? Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Did the Easter Bunny come to your house? Yeah. What did you get? Oh, sorry. Sorry, everyone. What did you get? Did you get Easter eggs? Yeah. Jelly beans? Oh, no, no. Did you get anything you liked? Yeah. Okay. Good, good, good. I'm really happy to hear that. So that is a fun part of Easter morning, but I am going to tell you the true story of Easter, okay, and why it is such a wonderful, joyous day here at church. And this is a story called Twas the Morning of Easter, and it's written by Glennis Nellist, who has given permission to all churches to share it on Easter morning, which is a really nice gift for us. "'Twas the morning of Easter before the sun rose. Two guards on a hillside were just trying to doze. You see, Jesus had died only three days before. A huge stone had been placed to seal the cave door. Can you see that? Yeah, you want to hold it for me? Thank you. That'd be wonderful. So there they are trying to sleep right in front of the cave door. The disciples were sleeping, but tossed in their beds as visions of danger swirled round in their heads. Would they be arrested and led away too? Without Jesus, their leader, what would they do? In her small, quiet home, not too far away, Jesus' friend Mary was planning the day. She would go to the cave with perfume and spice in hopes that her gifts would make Jesus smell nice. The sun through the trees was just starting to peep at the guards on the hill who were now fast asleep. With all of a sudden, there came an earthquake, and the rocks in the trees all started to shake. The guards jumped in fright, then fell straight to the floor as the stone rolled away and unsealed the door. Then Mary arrived and crept up to the crave, to the cave. She had to see Jesus. She had to be brave. But the cave was now empty. He just wasn't there. Mary sat down and wept, and her cries filled the air. But suddenly, Mary heard someone behind. Dear woman, who is that that you hope to find? Mary jumped up and turned around, so confused and afraid. Was this man the gardener? And why had he stayed? But the calm in his voice, the words that he said, soon led Mary to know she had nothing to dread. Dear Mary, it's me, it's Jesus, your friend. My story is just starting, this wasn't the end. His eyes, how they twinkled, his smile so bright. Mary knew in a moment, but could she be right? She gasped in surprise and cried, Jesus, it's you. You came back to life. Your promise came true. Jesus nodded and said, but there's no time to lose. You must tell the disciples, go, spread the good news. So she jumped to her feet and away Mary went. She had a story to tell, a tale heaven sent. She ran without stopping and called through the door. Disciples, you've never heard this news before. Now Peter, now James, now Thomas, now John. I went to the cave. Jesus' body was gone. 
But he called me by name. He's alive. It's true. It's a miracle only our great God could do. Then the trees seemed to dance, birds started to sing. All creation joined in to worship the king. He's alive, he's alive, the rocks cried in praise. The whole earth rejoiced on this day of all days. When later that night, Mary knelt down to pray, she thought all about that it happened that day. And the stars heard her whisper through the soft evening light. Happy Easter to all, and to all a good night. <laughs> I, <laughs> Hallelujah, Christ is risen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Danny and Oscar. Matt, I'm going to give you this because this will fit on the floor. All right. All right. There are multiple accounts of what happened in that garden millennia ago. Each gospel tells the story a little differently. Some scholars question whether Jesus' actual body came back to life at all. But some things are certain. Something powerful happened that day. Because the 11 disciples that had hidden in fear, first during Jesus' trial and crucifixion, then locked in a room to protect themselves from being arrested next, somehow found their courage and became evangelists and later martyrs for Jesus' gospel of God and love. Another certainty is that one of the first ones at the tomb that morning was Mary Magdalene. The gospel accounts differ about how many and which others arrived that morning, but all agree Mary Magdalene was there. She left her home in the dark as the Sabbath night was ending and arrived at the break of day where they had buried Jesus. The gospel of John tells the story this way. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene had, came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she went, she bent to look over in the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he said these things to her. Thank you, Matt. You know, being a pastor, every Easter you have to have a sermon. And some folks, you might know some of these folks, you might be some of these folks, it's all good, only come on Easter, so it's the only sermon they ever get to hear. 
and if you hear the same sermon year after year, well, Jesus died and he was risen. I mean, it's a miraculous story, but it kind of gets to sound a little boring after a bit, doesn't it? Wonder if he's going to rise again this year. I bet I know. <laughs> so I struggle with this sermon every year because I want it to be something that's worth your time. More than that, I want it to be something that's worth Christ's time because he went through a lot to get us all here today. And I want it to be something that if it's the only thing we hear all year, it feeds us for that year. Because it's really important, this story, not just because of what Jesus did or what God did through Jesus, but because of what it can mean right now in the places in your life and mine where we think we're alone in tombs. And if we're honest, we all think this in one way or another. We, every one of us today, no matter how good a week you're having, how good a year you've had, and most of us have had pretty challenging years this year, I know I have, most of us, even in the best of times, have some part of ourselves that is entombed, that feels alone, that feels abandoned, that feels like no one is ever going to get us, and if they get us, they're not going to accept us. And if they accept us, it's still not going to make us safe in the world. And even if we're safe in the world, there's still going to be things that hurt and people we care about that hurt that we're not sure we can do anything about. And so Easter, yes, it's about Jesus who was crucified, who was unjustly tried by empire because he was an inconvenient rabble rouser. And he came into town making a big stink, and the empire didn't want any trouble, and they needed an example. And Jesus knew it was likely going to be him. And he came into town wearing the grief and anxiety of that on his heart. And when he came into town, the other people nearby who were not part of his movement yelled out and said, tell your disciples to quiet the heck down. And Jesus knew his moment and looked around and said, if these quiet down, even the stones will cry out. We talked about that last week on Palm Sunday. Even the stones will cry out. I've been thinking about that ever since. It's a powerful statement. It's one of my favorite parts of the scripture because it's just so strange. I'm not sure if any of you have heard a stone cry. I don't think I have. But here's what I found out in my research this week. There was a guy, maybe some of you who are into plants and things have heard of him, because he's pretty famous, but his name is Cleve Baxter. Does this name mean anything to anybody? So, yeah, Heather says yes. Yeah. So this Cleve, I'm not surprised Heather knew. Uh, <laughs> Cleve Baxter did research on plants by doing things like putting something that was a lot like a lie detector on attaching them to the plant's leaves. And what he found out was when he did different things to and around the plants, the electric signal within the plants would react just the same way we do when you attach a lie detector to us. So Cleve did all sorts of things to and around these plants. One of the things he found, which is super interesting, I think, is that when he was eating lunch in front of the plants, they started to react. And as he studied this further, he realized that the plants were reacting because somehow they knew that he was eating one of their brothers or sisters or cousins. <laughs> so then he attached things to the food he was actually eating and they did not react much better. <laughs> yeah, the plants in the room could tell that he was eating another living thing. Here's where it gets really interesting. He also discovered those of us who may have indigenous roots in the room may not be surprised by this part, but he discovered that if he sent gratitude, like really thoughtful, intense gratitude and appreciation toward the thing he was about to eat, all those electrical signals in the food he was going to eat and the plants that were watching simmered down. How about that? When he expressed gratitude for his food, all the living things in the room relaxed. Wow. If I'm quiet, if my followers are quiet, 
about the need for love and justice and empathy in the world, even the stones will cry out. It turns out that while we as human beings have pretty limited language, we can talk to one another, but most of us have not accomplished talking to anything else. To the point that science has told us that if we believe that other animals have emotions, we're humanizing them, right? We're anthropomorphizing them. It's non-scientific. Well, Cleve Baxter is here to tell us that that's a bunch of hooey, and Jesus knew that before him. Because it turns out that God created, God created a planet, an ecosystem, a universe that is sentient. And the scriptures tell us that all the way through, but somehow modern science decided to set that aside. That was our big improvement. That was our progress. It's important to note this. Because so many of us think we're alone in the universe, and the truth is, we could not be further from that. The plants are paying attention to us. The plants in your household, those of you that have them, know you. There have been studies shown showing that when someone um, was keeping plants and was terribly afraid of flying, when he got on the plane and the plane began to take off and his anxiety level rose, the plants in his home reacted. They were that connected to him that they cared that he was anxious and they knew it. How about that? <laughs> we have a cat, Jojo, who will let us know when the other cats are at the door to come back inside. We have a dog, Charlie, that will break up the cats if they get fighting with each other when we're not home or when we are home, he takes care of things. There's this whole community going on in our household, whether we're there or not, and they've created their own ethical system their own relationships, because we can't speak their languages, but they sure speak ours. Have you seen the dogs and cats on TikTok that are talking with buttons now? Have you seen this? If you have not seen this, you need to get someone in your life to Google it for you so you can see it later today. It's crazy. There's this dog called Bunny. She literally has conversations. She can talk about the past and the future. She can ask questions. She wonders. She talks about her dreams. Seriously, she talks about her dreams. <laughs> the universe is talking to us endlessly. The trouble is that for some reason as human beings, in our culture anyway, we have stepped away from knowing that. I invite you all right now just to consider outside the window, when the sunshine just warmed there for a minute, did you notice that? There was just a minute where the sun got a little brighter. It'll happen again. Notice how your feelings swell with warmth when the sun does that. It's almost as if the sun knows you're feeling something, right? It's reaching out to warm you. I think there's something to that. Jesus said, if these disciples are quiet, even the stones would cry out. What would they cry out about? Turns out that when Cleve Baxter was studying plants, he got a little bit more um, subtle in his, in his science. He started trying out seeing if he just thought about harming the plants, what would happen? And it turned out that when he just thought about harming them, their electricity levels would kick in again. Jesus knew this too. He said, you've heard it said, do not kill. But I say to you, if you even think a harsh thought at your neighbor, you've already done them harm. Many of us wonder if prayer is a real thing. Well, I guess it depends on what you think prayer is. But if prayer is sending the intentions of your heart towards someone, it turns out even the plants know that that works. So think about it. Who have you sent ill thoughts toward? <laughs> Oops, right? I didn't say them out loud, so they don't count, right? I can just go to Easter dinner with my brother-in-law and think things toward him if I don't say them. <laughs> we are literally creating the experience that one another are having. We are literally creating the experience that the plants outside are having. When you walk through a garden, if you think gratitude and beauty at the plants, if you appreciate them, they will be healthier. 
that whole thing about talking to your plants, it works. Maybe it's the oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange, but more likely the science seems to be showing it's that you're loving them by talking to them and you're loving them by watering them and they can feel it and it helps them thrive. So if you believe in your children, if you believe in your difficult family members' ability to heal, <laughs> if you believe in the leaders of your government, imagine that. <laughs> if you believe in the possibility of better for humankind, you are literally helping to create it. The McMillans headed out after this morning's uh, sunrise service to head to DC so the girls could learn something about our nation and history. And it reminded me of the story about how the crime rates get so high in Washington, D.C. in the summer when it's hot. So years ago, I've talked about this before, someone did a study and they brought in a whole bunch of prayers from different perspectives, different backgrounds to come and pray summer in D.C. So this group of prayers got together and just prayed in whatever their tradition was for Washington, D.C., and do you know that summer the crate dropped exponentially just because some people had come there ahead of time and prayed? Imagine. Now, prayer isn't everything, right? The best kind of prayer is the prayer that we do with our feet. We say, I'm praying with my feet, right? Showing up, going where somebody hurts, going where there's a need, going where there's an injustice going where there's an opportunity for healing or growth or safety to be improved in the world. That's the best kind of praying when we get our whole bodies there with our hearts. But boy, if we get our hearts there, something still happens. Because Jesus said, even if these guys be quiet, the stones will know their hearts. The stones will cry out for them. I was having a conversation with Nora the other day about Good Friday, and Nora was giving me some insight, and it occurred to me that what you think happened on Good Friday, what you think died that day, what you think was crucified, has a big part to do in what you think comes back to life, what is saved at Easter. So. Remember when I said, I know that everyone in this room has some hurt in your heart, something you're carrying, whether it's for yourself or someone close to you or the world somewhere, all of us has a heavy stone we're carrying in our hearts. On Good Friday, it's a symbolic day and a real day for reflecting on the way we crucify. We crucify things in this world. We tramp on the plants, we tear down the trees, we destroy the ecosystem, we harm one another through our thoughts and our deeds. We create systems of oppression, and then we defend them. And on Good Friday, we reflect on what needs to change, because we remember the man who, in love, went all the way to execution rather, rather than turn back on his ideals. We've all seen that happen, and some of us have participated in it. We've all betrayed something we care about. But the God story is that love wins. And so if love hasn't won yet, as our friend Milton reminded us, mm, the story is not over. But how long will it take us, this arc of history, to bend toward love? Well, that depends on us. How loud will we let the voices of our hearts be? How open will we open the tombs of our hearts to welcome resurrection and new life? How much will we let it matter that God really is love, that the universe really is alive and listening and speaking to us? So what do you care about? Do you care about somebody who's broken in your family or your friend group? Do you care about folks who are living with addiction or injustice? Do you care about prison reform or our community locally? Do you care about the environment? Do you care about how safe the kids are in their schools? Do you care about, what do you care about? Do you care about artists being able to make enough to make it in the world? Do you care about music being available to everybody? 
Do you care about peace? What do you care about? You care about something. And you know why you care about it? There's a little tip. God put it there in you. Each one of us cares about something that needs to be cared about. And each one of us has the power to make it matter. So do you care about the plight of our trans siblings? Do you care about gay folks or people of different color? Do you care about people with different abilities? Do you care about planting more trees? God put that in you and gave you the power to make that matter. Jesus was one person. And his last prayer before the crucifixion was, if you believe in me, you, you, will do even greater things than I. And he prayed, God, let them be one as you and I are one. Let them also feel the life that we share. Let them know the power that is within them. Let the resurrection matter because, my friends, whether on that day, two millennia ago, Jesus was literally physically raised from the dead, it doesn't matter unless it changes you. Those disciples of his that were with him the whole way through all his teachings and his healings and his miracles, they scattered when he came to the cross. But then something happened. And whether he was physically resurrected in body, something happened on that Easter that transformed their lives so that all of a sudden, each and every one of those disciples no longer was so terrified. They found the power in their own hearts to believe in love. And every one of them became evangelists and eventually martyrs for the cause. And I'm not saying you have to be a martyr. <laughs> but I do think it's time for you to listen to the stones that are crying out in your life. I do think it's time for you to consider what things you're aiming your consciousness at. We have celebrated creation through Lent here at NMCC. And there's a beautiful, famous saying that says, they thought they were burying us, but they didn't know we were seeds. The thing in your life that you think is burying you, the thing in the world that you carry about, care about that you think is being buried, consider that God is a miraculous and powerful God. And you, you are a seed. I want to read a poem to you and then I'm going to sit down. It's called, What is Hope? It's by Ruben Alves, who's a Brazilian theologian, and here's the poem. What is hope? It's a presentiment that imagination is more real and reality less real than it looks. It is a hunch that the overwhelming brutality of facts that oppress and repress is not the last word. It is a suspicion that reality is more complex than realism wants us to believe. And that the frontiers of the possible are not determined by the limits of the actual. And that in a miraculous and unexpected way, Life is preparing the creative events which will open the way to freedom and resurrection. The two, suffering and hope, live not far from each other. Suffering without hope produces resentment and despair. Hope, hope without suffering, creates illusions, naivete, and drunkenness. Let us plant dates, even though those who plant them will never eat them. We must live by the love of what we will never see. This 
is the secret discipline. It is a refusal to let the creative act be dissolved in immediate sense experience and a stubborn commitment to the future of our grandchildren. Such disciplined love is what has given prophets, revolutionaries, and saints the courage to die for the future they envisioned. They make their own bodies the seed of their highest hope. That is what Jesus did so long ago, and that is why his story matters to us now, if you choose to believe it. Thanks be to God. I invite our ushers forward. I'm not sure where the offering plates have gotten to. Here they are, thank you. <laughs> it takes a village. And again, if you'd like to make an offering for Ukraine or for our Deacons Fund to support our neighbors, you can do that with the envelopes in your pews, otherwise loose plate, we know what to do with it. Thank you for your support of the missions and ministries of this congregation. And if you are a giver who gives, you know, virtually, do not feel ashamed to let the plate go by. It's okay, we know. Thank you for all the ways you support us. And I invite the choir forward, trying not to trip over the ushers <laughs> for our offertory.
Amen. Hallelujah. As the choir takes their seats, I'm going to invite the ushers to keep the offering in the back, and we're just going to bless it from here just for, you know, people moving places. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Holy and generous God, you gave us gifts that we cannot comprehend and sometimes struggle even to receive, but we thank you. And we pray that the offerings that we have shared with you today and throughout the year, the offerings of our time, our talent, our treasure, and even our lives, please you, make you proud of us, and, and renew your faith in the humanity that you created and our ability to grow in love here in the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I think it's time for prayer. Thank you. And now uh, is, it, is the time during our service where we speak aloud uh, or, or in our hearts, we lift them up, our joys and concerns. And look at all these pink pieces of paper today, the joys. So uh, Matthew, our Deacon Matthew, Junior Deacon Matthew, plans to go to Yukon at Avery Point in the fall. Yeah. And he'll be studying computer engineering and psychology. We are so excited for his college journey and so proud of you, Matthew. Love, Mom, Ethan, and Danny, and all of us. <laughs> uh, grateful for Gail Faithful. I second that. There she is. <laughs> grateful for Gail. It was a joy to rescue the message today to love with hope, or to live with hope. Same thing, really. <laughs> Uh, gratitude for some excellent test results. Phew, and praise God. Amen. Blessings on the angels among us who have created such a beautiful altar this Lent and Easter tide. Amen. It's really beautiful. So happy to see our friend Jack Matter here today. Jack is a member of a St. Louis church Heather used to serve and studies at Yale. Welcome, Jack. <laughs> and we have a joy. I am grateful to my healthcare colleagues spending their Easter healing and comforting the ill especially in nursing homes, a hard place to be on the holidays. Also excited to have our guest, Lauren, join us at today's service. And this is from Abby Murphy. It's nice to see you today, Abby. And this is from Eileen. It is a joy to report that my Aunt Shirley is doing well after a stroke scare. It turned out to be a UTI instead. Praise God. Yep. It, was, it can cause havoc. Yeah. And on my lean, it is a joy to know that my daughter, Elizabeth, is joining us online from her college dorm room. Happy, happy Elizabeth. We love you. <laughs> Holy humor, Batman. Next week is Holy Humor Sunday. That will be fun. All right, and now, oh, let me check the phone here. Um, I know, Tom and I, oh, I got it. Okay. Um, there's a joy. No, no, that's an old joy. Looks like actually the phone is clear for today. Okay, so we will turn to our concerns and... Um, we are asking continued prayers for the people in Ukraine, and now especially for Eastern Ukraine. And this is from Sally, and I know we are all feeling that. So we will lift these, these 
joys and concerns and all that's in our heart up to God now in prayer. Thank you, Melissa. Let's unite our hearts. Holy One, we know that you gather in our mother's wombs and you know every thought in our heads and sinew of our bodies. You know all the places that need resurrection, light, and love right now. So help us to open ourselves, to make ourselves available to you and to all the love and light that you want to pour into each of us. Help us to remove the doubts that make us think we might not be worth it, or that you might be imaginary, or that hope might be too much, or that the things other people have told us about ourselves might be truer than our own belief that we might be more. Help us today, O oh God, to open ourselves truly to receive your Easter light and healing and transformation, because until we allow ourselves to be healed, until we allow ourselves to believe that we are enough, that our presence here on this planet is all the permission we need to shine our lights brightly because you created us exactly as we are. All the imperfections and the quirkinesses and the beauty until we believe that, how in the world are we going to learn to love one another in the way we all need to love and be loved? And how in the world are we going to learn to love you? Because you yourself told us through the scriptures, if I can't love my neighbor that I can see, then how the heck can I love my God that I cannot? So help us, O oh God, today to open our hearts and our ears, the ears of our soul, and to listen to all the amazing, miraculous beauty within us and around us. The sunlight, the blossoming, Ukrainian freedom fighters, teachers who've hung out throughout COVID and made it, keeping students afloat, bus drivers, grocery store workers, medical professionals, from those pushing carts to cleaning up, to doctors and researchers, to aides and nurses and kitchen staff who are still showing up to work, service providers who have been treated horribly by the public but still keep putting on a smile and looking for those whose day they may brighten. Help us, God, to be those and aspire to be those and help us to bless those. And for all those in the world who are suffering today, the folks who put themselves on harm's way for the good of others, the folks who are in harm's way through no fault of their own, the folks living in violence and betrayal, the folks living with diagnoses that are terrifying, the folks living with questions, the folks living with addictions, mental health struggles, broken relationships, God, shine your Easter light into all those places and help us to be mirrors reflecting that light as well. For all these prayers we've lifted up aloud and for those we hold quietly in our hearts, we ask your care. And we send right now our prayer like a giant prayer blanket around the earth holding all of this planet, its ecosystems, its animals, its critters of all sorts, the very stones, and even we human beings, holding all of us in prayer. We pray, God, that we may be part of the Easter solution. We may be part of your love taking root again in the world. And we pray the prayer your son taught us in the words of the New Zealand Book of Prayer. Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. 
the hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. I invite the choir. Now, normally we would pass out the scores for the Hallelujah Chorus so everyone could join along, but you know COVID. So um, if you want to hum along quietly be behind your mask, please do. And as the choir takes their places, I invite you all to rise, as is the tradition, if you're comfortably able. For Hallelujah. Oh, Roberta says you can come and sing with us if you'd like to join the choir and you have a mask.
And the altos made our entrance. Well, people of God, followers of Christ, Easter people, remember, life is short, and we don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who make this journey with us, so be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And may the God who loves us and who made us and who makes this journey with us be with us all from now and for always. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ the worship is ended. So this may begins. Now we sing Shalom. If you don't know, just sing along in your hearts. Go in peace, everybody. Oh, and if you'd like to take your plants, you may take them. <laughs>